morning, everyone. Hi, good evening. We're going to be starting uh, in a few minutes. We're just going to wait for some more folks to join in. Hi, Loretta. Hi, how are you? Alyssa? Good. I figured I'd come for the introductory introductions. Awesome. Awesome. Hi, Dan. You're muted. Oh, hi, Alyssa. How are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Very excited to be here. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, attending today's event. It should be a good one. Well, we're excited to have you here. Excited to be here. Loretta's our uh, events coordinator here at 4Geeks. So oh, I nice to meet you, Loretta. You nice meeting you too. Oh, so can we give um, Sid presenting? Yeah, do you um, want to test the screen share, you mean? Or? Yeah, I just want to make sure that Sid can present the slides for today um, that he's going to be going over. Mm -hmm. Just because we yeah. typically um, use Google Meet, so Blue Jeans yeah. might. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Um, if you have the app, it's at the top. I'm not sure if you're on your browser, if it's still at the top, but there's a share screen button. I mean, it's uh, pretty much the same process. Okay. Test it out right now. Go ahead. Okay, so app, and then it's oh yeah, it's working. It's mm -hmm. it. Yep, perfect. Great. Awesome. I know we have quite a few registrations, so uh, I'm sending a reminder on our Slack channel right now. If you guys can maybe just wait like two or three minutes, and I'm sure more people are going to be joining. Sounds oh, good. Awesome. Hi, Sid. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm Loretta. I'm doing I'm well. Modern. Awesome. Well, I know we have a lot of folks that are excited to hear from you and they have tons of questions. So uh, we'll be starting in a few minutes. And just so you know, 4Geeks is slowly making a transition over to Google Meet. <laughs> so we we like that platform a lot better. We just Love haven't. Love to hear it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so probably if we do another event together, it will be on Google. Implementing awesome. it in the cohorts first. Because when you have so many people and so many different meetings going on at the same time, we've had bugs or issues in the past. We want to do it slowly to make sure the seamless integration. But hopefully by the next time, we'll be on Google Meet when we have an event. Oh, very cool. Makes sense. Okay, we're going to wait maybe one or two more minutes before we get started. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Hi, Alberto. Albert. <laughs> How are you doing? Hey, 
I did want to just share and reference, we do have a form uh, for attendees to fill out. This is an attendance form. Um, I'm going to drop it in the chat here, probably a couple times throughout the presentation. So um, feel free to go ahead and fill this out. Okay, so the time I have is 6.05. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome everyone to our event from boot camp to Google. Um, I'm going to be your moderator this evening. My name is Loretta Thompson. I'm the partnerships and community engagement uh, manager at 4Geeks Academy. Uh, I see some folks here who are current 4Geeks Academy students and some folks who are alumni and a few people that I don't recognize. Uh, so if this is your first time attending, uh, we welcome you. Um, so a little bit about 4Geeks. We are an online coding bootcamp based in Miami. Uh, we train on software development and data science and machine learning. And we have 10 locations across seven different countries, including North, North and South America and Europe. Uh, with the program, uh, we do have some really unique po components called Geek Pal and Geek Force. With Geek Pal, uh, you're able to schedule one-on-one -on -one sessions with a uh, with a mentor. You have that uh, that service for life. And also with Geek Force, which is our career development wing, where they will help you uh, put together your resume, your LinkedIn, uh, help you with technical interviews. You also have that service for life as well, which is a huge benefit, I will tell you. Um, then, and of course, that's unlimited membership and limited career support. Um, and we have students that we have graduated about, it's about now maybe about 40. Well, like maybe about 4,000, 4,300, yeah, somewhere in that end. Similar. Yeah, and we have students that are working uh, all across Miami, the country, the world, uh, companies that you may recognize, such as Google, eBay, Facebook, which is Meta, and also companies that um, have large software um, departments within themselves. So um, that's pretty much it. I know that everyone is here not to hear me speak, but to hear about the experiences at Google with um, with our partners here from Google, uh, Daniel Brown and Sid LaLuz, uh, who will talk about his personal experience. So I will encourage you to please wait until after the presentation to ask your questions. Um, please make sure that you fill out that Google Forms that, uh, that Dan put in the chat. And of course, if you have questions and you don't want to forget them, you can put those in the chat as well. But we do want you to please wait until after their presentation. So, all right. Uh, all right, guys, take it away. All right, uh, Dan, I'll go on and get started here. Uh, so I have my slide deck, just a moment. All right. Here we go. Uh, so I'm testing a feature, new feature in slides where you have your image embedded there. Uh, let's go on and get started. So for some quick context, I graduated from a boot camp as well. Uh, and this is all from my experience going from a boot camp to a position at Google. Uh, I'm not officially speaking for Google, but I'm trying to give you the best advice I can as a boot camp graduate. So uh, this is all based off of personal experience. I'll also go over some interviewing tips. I've been both a interviewer professionally and an uh, interviewee, obviously. Uh, so I'll give you some advice on that as well. And as was just mentioned, uh, you can uh, put your questions in chat, but I'll answer them at the end of the presentation. So uh, tip one, 
you aren't an imposter and you don't have to suffer from imposter syndrome. So what is imposter syndrome? Uh, basically, imposter syndrome is the belief that you aren't qualified to do your job. You're an imposter in your field. It isn't specific to coding. Uh, it, you can feel this in any aspect of your life. Uh, but there isn't one way to be a coder. And actually, coding was founded in large part by a lot of people who now have been dismissed by, you know, the typical coder as not being coding material. That is women, people of color, uh, queer people, etc. In fact, coding was founded, according to many people, by Ada Lovelace, who is uh, the daughter of Lord Byron. Uh, she had a very atypical sort of background and uh, lifestyle, but she was the first one to use a calculating machine and determine, wow, we could actually use this to program behavior besides just adding numbers. Similarly, Alan Turing helped us win a whole war by code breaking and uh, cracking the Enigma code. And he was a queer man. Dorsey Vaughn worked with the NASA space program and she was an African-American woman. And her and her colleagues helped get America on the moon. Jerry Lawson was an African-American game developer. We had a Google Doodle honoring him, and he was very innovative in his work. And then the last example I have here is Louis Von Ahn. He is from Guatemala, and he made Duolingo. So essentially, if you feel like an imposter because you're a member of a minority group, please don't feel that way. In fact, much of our greatest successes are owed to people who are considered minorities and aren't what you typically think of as a coder. Some of the best advice I got while I was in boot camp to deal with imposter syndrome is to just remember that all you need to do to be a coder is to code every day. And this advice is great for two reasons. One, um, it's absolutely true. Uh, a coder doesn't necessarily need to have a degree. Uh, there are many CEOs who don't even have a college degree at all. And uh, the second point is the more you code, the more of a great coder you'll become. And if you do it every day, <laughs> that will give you a great start. And I took this advice very literally, and it really helped me out. Um, on the inverse side, I was once told by someone who had very many degrees who I admired, I learned 90% of what I do as a coder on the job. And I heard this even just recently in the office, that most people learn much of what they do on the job. So even if you come from a boot camp and you don't have a formal degree, uh, just keep in mind that everyone is basically in the same boat. Uh, and then on <laughs> to give another counter example, I've met someone who had very impressive degrees, but they weren't that great of a coder. I once had a colleague who graduated from Stanford, and he made me feel very insecure because he was often bragging about how he was launching satellites at Stanford and all of this, you know, very fancy stuff I've never done in my life. But it turned out after a year on the job, he wasn't really coding that much. And then management actually audited his code and found that he had made exactly one change in his entire time on the job, which was a typo fix in some text. So in this case, we had someone who loved to brag about his credentials all day, but for whatever reason, he wasn't coding. Maybe he wasn't confident or even able to really code. So you really need to not write yourself off for coming from a boot camp. As long as you put in the hard work of coding, you can become a coder. Uh, so uh, here's my next tip. Apply to as many places as you can and be selective in the offers you receive. So this is some advice I got while I was in boot camp, which was apply for 30 tech positions a day. Uh, this may be a little bit excessive depending on you know how much time you have in the day, but I definitely encourage you to apply to at least 10 positions a day. Uh, include positions of all sorts, contracting positions, et cetera, but only accept the highest quality position. So to give a quick anecdote uh, from when I was a coder, 
uh, or rather applying early on out of a boot camp. Uh, I was um, applying for several positions. I got a job offer after interviewing with Walmart Labs. I also got a job offer from a small edutech startup. And when I talked about my offers to my teacher, he said, pick the highest quality offer, pick the Walmart Labs offer. Uh, I didn't really like Walmart for ideological reasons. You know, I thought they were a big, heartless corporation, and I ended up working for the startup. But I see now, in retrospect, how this really set back my career. If I were working for Walmart, I would have worked up with software that it was much larger scale. Uh, I would have worked with more modern technologies. Walmart was using Angular, which was brand new at the time, whereas the Edutech startup was using PHP, which is now rarely used. Uh, so be selective with offers you get, but for the initial phase, definitely apply as much as you can because I probably applied to about 30 places before I even got interviews with these two companies. Uh, early on, you should also be wary of job hopping. Uh, contracts tend to be short term and they will make it look like you have a background where you job hop. And this is another mistake I made, is I um, basically was settling for whatever position I could get after that initial startup position. A lot of these were contracts. And almost every single time I've talked to a recruiter since, except for recently, now that I'm working longer at other companies, they would say, why do you job hop so much? It, it can signal to people a lack of commitment, uh, a lack of staying power, et cetera even if it's not even your fault and it has to do with fixed term contracts. So uh, whatever you choose starting out out of a boot camp, uh, be prepared to commit to that role. So uh, in terms of the whole multiple role scenario, you have about two weeks to consider an offer and the best place to be is to have multiple offers in hand. Uh, why is this? One uh, is because you can use these offers to negotiate salary. Let's say you get an offer from your dream company, but they're going to only pay you half as much as an offer from another company you like less. Well, you can go back to your dream company and say, hey, this other company is offering to pay me twice as much. Uh, do you think you can meet this? And they might even be able to fully meet that wage or move up their offer. And then you get the best of both wor worlds. You get your dream job and you get a better wage while you do it. So this is another reason why the 30 positions a day advice is good. The more roles you apply for, the more uh, interviews you will have in the pipeline, and ultimately the more offers you may receive. Uh, and then lastly, the more you apply, the more practice you'll get. As we all know, interviewing can be pretty intimidating. It's a whole process of answering technical questions and coding in front of someone. The more you apply, the more interviews you get, the more practice you'll get. Uh, and just don't give up. Uh, the only people I've ever seen fail coming out of a boot camp were people who gave up. Uh, I had a friend who actually helped pay for her whole boot camp. And after a month of applying, she came to me and she said, you know, I haven't gotten an offer yet. This is really discouraging. But I encouraged her. I said, you don't give up. Please don't give up. Uh, something will come eventually. Unfortunately, she did give up. And now she just you know does landscaping and she has this whole education which she didn't really leverage in contrast i had a student i was teaching while i was actually teaching for a boot camp he was a chef who wanted to enter uh, coding and he didn't give up he kept working at it for six months and ended up last year getting a great job that he still has today making about four times more money than he was making as a chef and it took him six months, but the important thing was he didn't give up like my friend who gave up after a month, and it's been transformative for him. So it can be discouraging, but please, please, please don't give up. And it sounds like you're in a great program by offering continued membership, definite, or uh, mentorship. Uh, definitely leverage that. Not all programs do that. It sounds like you all are running a great program here or are participating a very good program that does care about you. Uh, next, uh, make your own interview practice and coding practice. So uh, there's been no better time to learn to code. There are free sites literally everywhere. 
There are even uh, uh, sites that will create a virtual machine for you to hack if you want to get into cybersecurity. Programs like this were completely unheard of uh, just 10 years ago and earlier. Uh, so you're really blessed with this. Uh, please use these resources. Uh, in terms of making your own practice, you can consider the typical coding interview structure. So generally, this will involve five to 10 minutes of introductions. You can practice this. Uh, set a timer for a whole interview and make sure you're handling sort of that introduction phase. Then it'll generally involve 30 to 50 minutes of coding and five to 10 minutes of closing questions. Some interviews will also add in the inter introduction some technical questions, like tell me about your background, uh, what's your experience with databases? Uh, they'll be very open-ended. You want to practice answering these types of questions as well. But the most important thing here is the 30 to 50 minutes of coding. The way you can make your own practice here is you can pull a question from a site like Leap Code and set a timer. Generally, interviews won't involve the easiest questions. You should target at least medium level problems on Leap Code and other platforms and then you'll want to set a timer. Uh, try to do this at least once a day. Uh, that's how I prepared. Every day on my morning commute, which happened to be about 30 to 50 minutes long, I would pick a question and try to solve it during my commute. Uh, one more important uh, uh, point is practice in the same medium you'll be coding in. If you're offered a coding interview, uh, you can ask, am I going to be doing this on a whiteboard? Am I going to be doing this in a text editor? Am I going to be doing it in a specific online editor? Try to get as much information as you can here so that when you're coding, you're using the same platform. I've seen very intelligent candidates fail when they are too used to using things like VS Code, which have a lot of convenience features like code completion and they'll get even frustrated during the interview saying, oh, in VS Code, this would autocomplete. Oh, this is so annoying. Well, it's sort of them relying too much on a crutch and you need to be prepared in whatever medium you're going to do to actual interviewing. Uh, so yeah, that's the point here. Don't get spoiled by IDEs or any specific tools. Definitely try to prepare uh, for that sort of minimal environment where you may just have a text editor, for instance. So I just want to put it all together and give a quick anecdote about my experience going from a boot camp to Google. So uh, uh, this is going to start way back because I, I want to sort of convey that uh, no matter what your background, you can do this. So I grew up really poor. Uh, while I had friends who had computers, my family couldn't afford one. And my family also couldn't afford daycare. So they would basically dump us at a library. So while I was at the library, I saw some kids using the old library catalog, and I'm very old, so it was like green text on a black screen, and they were playing games on it. And I was like, what are you doing? This is awesome. And I learned to hack library terminals from them in order to reroute the address of the library catalog to online games, which are called MUDs or Telnet games. So the point here is that even forever ago, again, I'm very old, so 30 years ago, when there wasn't leak code, when computers were pretty rare and my family was too broke to afford one, I was able to find opportunities to code. And again, just remember that you have a lot of resources. If you're curious about something, just look it up online and you'll probably find resources where you can learn how to do this, the same thing, use the technology you want to use, et cetera. Uh, I got a little discouraged because of the 1999 to 2000 tech crash. And my mother was also studying engineering and electrical engineering around this time. And she was very discouraged. She had a teacher even relatively recently who was so sexist. He said, why are you in my class when a man can be in this class? And these two experiences of seeing companies blow up, you know, sort of similar to what we're seeing now, and seeing the sexism my mom faced, um, I was actually a girl at the time, I'm trans, I was born female, really discouraged me. And I thought, oh, I don't want to be a coder. Uh, if I had kept my interest and kept studying coding, I don't even know where I would be right now.
maybe I'd be, you know, a big shot TL making a ton of money or something like that. Um, the point here is don't be discouraged. Yes, the economy is rough right now, but that can actually be a great opportunity for people like you. Uh, I don't want to get too into the nitty gritty, but sometimes a lot of experience and compensation can actually be a, a, a setback in this environment. And people will be more interested in hiring new people who can adapt and learn and then sort of earn those promotions. So ironically, you might be in a perfect position while other people are struggling in this economy. So I went to a co college I offered full financial aid, but didn't have a computer science program. But I met a student there who was remotely working for Google at the time. So uh, the point here is that Google looks for talent but beyond traditional grads. They were hiring my friend who was an anthropology major, uh, but he happened to know how to code. And similarly, he encouraged me. He, he said, you know, I went to this school in part because I didn't think I would be a coder, but I got this job offer and now I am, and you should definitely do the same thing. So again, it's sort of that imp imposter syndrome question. You really don't need to think of yourself as an imposter. Uh, so I worked as a teach teacher and then a dishwasher during another recession, uh, but I learned to code during my lunch breaks as a dishwasher. And so, some of my coworkers were impressed and were like, wow, you're a hacker. But most of my coworkers made fun of me. They said, oh, you think you're so smart. You aren't anything special. Like they would bully me like, uh, you know, the bad sitcom or something. Uh, just because I was reading a textbook when literally none of my peers were reading anything during lunch. So again, don't feel like an imposter and just stick with it. And especially if you have other people actively discouraging you, well, someday you might be able to prove them wrong. So I got my first job with a nonprofit tech company. Again, it was an edutech startup. But eventually I got a job at Tesla, Facebook, and Google. So the point here is wherever your career starts out, you can go anywhere once you get your foot in the door. This is again why you need to, you know, really take seriously this advice I got from my boot camp, which is apply to a lot of roles and uh, don't rule any out until you're at the offer phase. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, gigs, contracts, full-time positions. Uh, be creative when you look for roles. So here are some resources. Uh, some co common coding sites include LeetCode and HackerRank, obviously. Uh, more and more of these are opening up every day. Feel free to talk to your peers about this because I've found that in boot camps, anyone can come in with resources already. And some of the most interesting resources I've heard about were just through conversations with my peers. Uh, sorry, I accidentally clicked on the link. Uh, there we go. Uh, as I mentioned before, you really need to target medium to hard level questions. Uh, I, it's fine to get comfortable with easy questions at first, but uh, when you start interviewing, you need to make sure you're working on these harder questions. Uh, Google even has some coding lessons for your phone. This is just a quick plug for this resource from Google, but it's more to say you can even practice on your phone while you're commuting. Uh, if you don't have a LinkedIn pro profile, make one now and connect with all your classmates and to build your network. This is very important. Uh, uh, when I was teaching boot camps, what seemed to differentiate candidates who got job offers quickly versus those who got them to work sl slowly was definitely their LinkedIn profile. It builds a lot of credibility. Uh, it, it makes you a closer connection to recruiters automatically. Um, it's very important. Uh, don't be embarrassed if you don't have a lot of followers on LinkedIn uh, because uh, or connections rather. Because once you start getting a few, especially establishing yourself in tech, more will come. There's a bunch of people who will randomly connect with you if you're in tech on LinkedIn. Along those lines, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to. I'm also happy to give advice. Uh, I really believe in helping people who are in your position, uh, in part because it is kind of lonely being a boot camp grad at Google. I'm the only boot camp grad I know. Um, and I really want to help you guys, so feel free to connect. If you don't have a GitHub profile yet, make one and upload your work, including your practice done for interviews. I've had uh, uh, recruiters reach out to me because of my GitHub. Uh, it, it shows your practice, your abilities, 
And also, you can just get a sense of accomplishment. Uh, if you code every day, put that code up every day. It looks impressive, and it can actually get you contacted. Uh, uh, make a personal website and include your resume. Include links or screenshots of projects with links to relevant repos. So uh, again, coming out of boot camp, my peers who got the best jobs right out of boot camp, people who are hired to places like Google immediately, they had great personal websites. Uh, I got a great uh, tip from another Google engineer uh, presenting in a presentation like this actually, that if you have an interactive hosted application, that's also very impressive. Uh, something like a chat application, for instance. Uh, uh, that will, um, you know, prove to whoever is looking at your profile or recruiting that you can actually do what you say you can do. Uh, so that concludes my formal presentation, but I just want to reiterate that you should not give up and you should really make the most of this opportunity you have before you now. Uh, coding actively every day and proving that on your GitHub uh, will serve you well years down the line even. Uh, your profile like on all of these sites is important and you have resources, it sounds like, through mentorship, which not all boot camps have. Please leverage those. Uh, at this point, I'll see if we have any questions. Let's see, I see the chat here. All right, yes, awesome. You have tons Let's of see. questions. You do awesome. have a number of questions in here. <laughs> all right, thank you all. I'm glad you're all engaged. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. The more engaged you are with this, uh, it's, it's just a positive effect on your prospects. So quick question, as the current job market today is very competitive and uh, because of the layoffs this year, I've received some advice rather to network an event and spend time coding, making projects uh, on my own, rather than apply for tabs and positions on time. Yeah, 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 online. Um, yes, I would agree that networking now is more important than ever. Uh, you, you never know who, in your, who you've met in the past who may be a coder now as well. Uh, the funny thing about working at Google is I've actually run into old friends of mine who I never figured would become a, a, a coder now working at Google. So even go back to high school, you never know who you've met at any point in your life who may be able to be a good contact. Uh, I uh, have a little bit of social anxiety. I don't consider myself the most social person. So one thing I've done to network as well is to take additional courses such as uh, one-off, like one-day machine learning courses. I found free courses like this, and that ended up being a great networking opportunity. Furthermore, you can put on your resume, I know machine learning because I completed this course. Uh, so really look for any opportunity you can, such as meetups, classes, et cetera, but also look at your existing network, even all the way back to high school or middle school, because you never know who has become a coder today. Uh, and again, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I don't mind. Uh, okay, next question. As someone fresh out of boot camp, to what degree should we uh, take the experience requirements with a grain of salt? I see a lot of junior positions asking for five plus years experience and a lot that ask for experience in things I don't know yet. I tend to not apply to those places as I feel I don't have the experience they want. Should I be? Uh, I, yes, I would recommend applying. So my first job out of boot camp it involved PHP. I wasn't coding in PHP at all. I applied anyway, and I studied for PHP two weeks before the interview. And I ended up doing completely fine coding in PHP. A lot of languages are more similar than you think. A lot of uh, syntax in PHP is actually similar to syntax in Java. And uh, obviously JavaScript, is similar to Java as well. Uh, all of these languages are pretty closely related. Uh, there, there are a few with completely distinct concepts like Erlang or Elixir. They, they are very different from the scripting languages you may be familiar with, but you can still study for these. Again, the resources we have available today are immense. So uh, in terms of five plus years experience, yes, that can be intimidating. Outside of the question of what skills do you actually know, uh, the whole experience question can be ad addressed creatively as well. So uh, you can look back on your past positions for any technical experience you've had. 
So as I mentioned, before I got into coding, I was a teacher, but I was actually a STEM teacher. And I have an, another colleague here at Google who used to be a STEM teacher as well. He was teaching math and science. And Google actually found that experience appealing. He was uh, learning coding for fun uh, in order to better teach his students. And he found something called a rabbit hole at Google, where if you took enough of these little coding prompts uh, that are directly available through the Google browser, you will actually have your profile sent to a recruiter who reaches out to you. He had no idea he was going to become a coder. He was just a teacher. But his experience as a science teacher just happened to overlap enough for him to interview with Google and then eventually get an offer from Google. Uh, similarly, I've had students who were accountants, who were architects, and they were able to say, hey, I have ex five years experience as an architect. This is a highly technical field where I'm using a CAD program all day. And he got a great role uh, after graduating from a boot camp because that is technical experience. So when you see things like at least five years of software engineering experience, you can get a little creative with that. Anytime you use software professionally or heavily in your education, you can count that experience. And then if they, and then just to reiterate, if they mention a specific language, you can study that specific language. So definitely don't rule out any role that you feel you're even half qualified for. All right, uh, more questions. Uh, is there anything uh, you starting, started to do or change in your job search that made a big difference in getting responses from recruiters? Uh, so, as far as web dev, is there any language or framework that may not be taught now and you feel is on the rise and would be good to learn to get an advantage? Yes. Uh, so, big changes to resume. List all of your skills uh, if they're, you know, as they're relevant. So, again, even if you've only been in a boot camp recently, but you built a website back in middle school, you can cite that experience. Well, what was involved in building your middle school website? Well. CSS, HTML, all of that. Have a skill section where you list CSS, HTML, JavaScript, Angular, React. You might be impressed by how long your skill list actually is. Again, I think a lot of us are suffering from imposter syndrome and we're writing ourselves off. Just try to itemize it as a list. And if you have at least 10 items, put down your resume. It will make your resume stand out. Also, a lot of recruiters will scan your resume. They, they use some sort of OCR if it's a PDF, and then they will actually scan it for skills. And then your resume will pop up when those skills are matched. And as I mentioned previously, even if you're only starting to learn a language, like you just started today on Leak Code, learning, uh, let's say, uh, Kubernetes or something. I don't know if Leak Code has Kubernetes, but you just started literally today learning a skill. Well, as long as you invest some time in that, you can list that on your resume. So I would encourage you to itemize your skills. And if you have at least 10, include that in a section on your resume just to make sure it will appear in searches. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, for any past roles you've had, try to list anything that's technical or quantitative. So again, while I was a teacher, I was helping the teachers manage the whole attendance database. Again, just because I was the youngest teacher there and somewhat technical, and we had teachers still filling in paper attendance forms, which I would have to, have to input for them. So it sounds really trivial, but the way I describe this on my resume is that I managed an attendance database of more than 2 million records, which was easily true because they had more than 20 years of data there, and I remember running a count on a table once and it had about 2 million records, right? So the point being is I was just doing attendance for a school, but I was able to uh, depict that that was pretty technical. I mean, if it wasn't technical, why were these older teachers asking me to do it? Again, a lot of experience that we tend to write off is actually experience that not everyone has. So in terms of new languages, Kotlin is a good new language to learn. One, because it can be used uh, in the same way as traditional Java, as a backend language, it can be used for you know, traditional computer software. But it also compiles very well into a, a mobile application. And this way uh, you get sort of two for one. 
you get experience that can be applicable to back-end engineering or traditional software engineering, and you get experience applicable to mobile engineering. So I'm a big Sid, fan of Kotlin. Name, Sid, what was the name of that language again? If you can yeah, Kotlin. Again. I'll put it in chat here. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, this is a fairly new language. Uh, I will say not all new trendy languages are worth investigating. Uh, so for instance, I remember uh, there was, it was called not Firebase or something. It was, it was a competitor to uh, Angular and React. And now people, I, I can't even recall what it was, but it was nearly an equal competitor. Now, an example I can recall is Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails was uh, considered groundbreaking. It has very similar syntax to Python. And a lot of startups were starting to use Ruby on Rails. This was more of a symptom of uh, economic effects. Ruby on Rails was popular, while a lot of startups were being founded in the rebound after the 2000 crash. But now you'll find Ruby on Rails is much more rare. I haven't encountered it at all at Google. The last time I encountered it was when I was working for Tesla about six, seven years ago. Uh, so the point here is you can also be critical of trendy new languages popping up. Uh, some of them may just be a trend. But I, I will reiterate what I think is actually useful. Kotlin, uh, React is very useful. Uh, you now you know I'm unbiased because Google Angular is competing with React. But React is very powerful for the same reason as Kotlin. You can use it as React Native, which is good for mobile applications, or you can use it for traditional websites, like you know an HTML-based website. So I really strongly recommend React. And then lastly, some of the best languages to learn aren't necessarily the newest, fanciest, trendiest languages. Uh, every company I've worked for, including Facebook, they could not hire enough C engineers, be it C Sharp, C++, et cetera. And uh, they were literally flying in people fresh out of high school from around the world just because they knew a C language. That's how much the skill is needed. So you may want to consider looking at older languages that are core to, you know, hardware engineering, a lot of critical functions, which is why C languages are needed. It can be intimidating, but there's no better time to learn than when you're starting out so that you get a sense of, you know, those practices early on. All right. Uh, share my GitHub. My GitHub is pretty darn inactive lately because I do a lot of work on an internal Google code. And obviously if I put my code at Google there, I'd be violating my contract here. Uh, but I, I, uh, it's the same name I think it's my LinkedIn, which I'll put here. Uh, so LinkedIn. So there you go, you're free to look me, look me up there. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty inactive because uh, the past uh, four years I've been working for Meta and Google, both of them are uh, have you know proprietary code bases, so I can't use GitHub as much anymore. Uh, but th that's, that's a, a good point. What if you can't uh, demonstrate your code on a site like GitHub for one reason or another? Uh, that's what where the personal website comes in. You're always free to include uh, your own hosted source code, things like that. You do want to demonstrate in some form that you're able to commit code. Uh, so uh, next question. With the conclusion of networking, networking being highly relevant, could I focus primarily, uh, sorry, I'm a little distracted, primarily on networking and tech events or applying for jobs? Which one should be my priority? I would say both. Uh, the best way to apply for a job is to combine it with networking. So let's say you see a role you're very interested in and it has a recruiter contact. Reach out to the recruiter when you apply. It confirms your interest and it uh, built, potentially builds a connection. The best advice I've actually gotten around my career was from a recruiter. Uh, uh, he even gave me a whole book to read. The book was called Clean Code, which was very influential and really helped me build some of the fundamentals that you get in a traditional education. So I do, uh, I can look up this book and paste it, but it's actually, it was, a, he gave it specifically to me because I was a boot camp grad. 
So uh, the point here is when you apply to a job, if you see, oh, this recruiter is open for questions, definitely take advantage of that and reach out to the recruiter. So I would say both are important. Uh, uh, definitely you do wanna, I said at least 10 roles a day. You may wanna take that advice, but at minimum, very minimum, I would encourage all of you to apply to 10 roles a week at very minimum. Um, again, because it can actually build connections, it starts getting your foot in the door. Um, if you aren't doing that, uh, it's the only way you can guarantee you're not going to get a job is if you don't apply. Uh, so please do keep applying. Uh, thank you for the resources other people have put here, such as the C++ book. Uh, I, uh, books, you know, they can seem irrelevant in this day and age, particularly with uh, interactive practice. But books are actually the best way, again, to simulate that sort of traditional uh, education where you get a degree. So uh, thank you for the individual who posted that. That's awesome. All right, looks like we got another question. Uh, uh, let's say you're trying to build your resume with projects and you're currently working on a very large passion project that is taking a long time to complete. Could you wait until the project is complete to use it in a resume or speak about it? So uh, this is a good question that relates to a concept in software engineer of agile development and iteration. I would encourage you to get an MVP version of your project available as soon as possible and put it up in a form where you can iterate on it. It's completely fine, say, if you host a interactive website where some of the links aren't there yet and it leads to a page saying, oh, this page is in development. That is completely fine. I would say it serves you to have a good portfolio earlier rather than later. One option here that I've seen other students take is to have screenshots of the project and a link to the source code. Uh, let's say you aren't ready to host it yet because you can't quite figure out how to get your deployment working. Uh, that's a case where you can take screenshots and add the source code. But as much as possible, I encourage you to have a deployment and iterate on it. Um, even if this project is very complex, uh, let's say it's, um, you know, it involves a, a HTML canvas with 3D rendered objects and uh, putting a minimal version of this up wouldn't really be impressive yet because you just have a cube spinning around, you know, something very basic like that. Well, one, I would encourage you to even put that up. It's still somewhat impressive. Uh, not everyone knows how to make a HTML canvas, much less render a 3D object within it. Uh, but two, this is a case where you can include mock-ups, source code, et cetera, uh, if you aren't quite prepared yet. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't see other questions here. Are there any other questions? Well, Sid, I will say I love your energy. I love your background story. I love all of that. So that in itself is an inspiration to me. I think that, I mean, I definitely feel a, a strong connection to you on that end. Um, I do have a question in terms of uh, what you had mentioned before about applying to a variety of places, right? But you're getting the best offer possible. So with a lot of folks who are starting out, um, should they, aim for those big dream jobs at the same time or should they just limit to themselves like i guess everyone's yeah. trying to find out what's the magic formula like you know do i apply to like if, if i'm trying to shoot for 10 a week right do three are three of them the big ones and then seven seven of them are like the locals but then i'm only getting offers from the locals what, what are your thoughts on that I would say it's good to uh, mix and uh, don't rule out any dream jobs whatsoever. Here are the reasons for it. One, if you apply for a dream job and you don't even get contacted, you're still going to end up in their database. And when you feel more ready and apply five years later, they'll see, oh, wow, this person applied five years ago. They really like our company. And I've gotten interviews with random companies that way. Uh, Google's one of them. Uh, I also had an interview uh, with Spotify because of that. I love Spotify. And I applied a long time ago, applied again, and they said, hey, I see you applied again. Now you're working at, you know, 
Don't mention that I was at Google at the time. But anyway, the point being is I'm still at Google, but I got a reply because I showed interest a long time ago. So that's reason one to apply for dream jobs. Two, you're in a, a, a sweet spot uh, when it comes to applying to dream jobs because you are going to be a new grad. And they do have roles for interns and uh, you know lower level employees. And again, ironically, even though there's a big downturn and a lot of layoffs, you might be a more attractive candidate than a more experienced candidate because of that environment. Um, uh, uh, I'm not saying Google does this, but there's a lot of uh, cost cutting at companies. And as a newer uh, candidate, you might actually be more appealing. And uh, I started my job in a recession, as I mentioned. And sometimes I wondered if I got hired because of dynamics like that. They could have either hired someone who was around all the way you know, back since the 1999 tech crash. Yeah, I'm sure an engineer from back then was better than I was as a boot camp grad at the time. But that engineer was probably asking for a lot more compensation a lot more accommodation to use the languages they were comfortable with. Meanwhile, here I was, I was like bright eyed and bushy tailed, like I wanna learn and do anything. And that's actually an ideal employee in a lot of ways. So please apply wherever, including Google. Uh, you're actually in a good position. And I do know bootcamp grads who have worked for Google, LinkedIn, other companies right out the door. Uh, but also apply for the smaller companies. And I've been, you know, sort of dissing this smaller company I worked for, but it was actually a very pleasant experience. Uh, I got to meet with the CEO directly. She was awesome. She cared a lot about her job and her her client, which were clients, which were students. Um, it was actually an awesome job in a lot of ways. So really don't rule out anything. Uh, if you feel even, like I said, halfway qualified or more, apply for it, no matter where it is. So another question. Okay, so if you go back in time to when you had that first job, um, and I guess drawing on that experience, as well as your experience as a, as a experienced software developer, what would you say are the skills that a, a brand new developer should have besides the language? Because let's say you got the technical thing reasonably okay. Like, what would you say are the things that would you could see that person having a career. And I guess I'm touching a little bit more on soft skills here. Yes, uh, so this is uh, the first skill that comes to mind. It sort of bridges soft and hard skills, which is an ability to learn quickly. I've seen a lot of people build their career early on based off of that. You can prove it, for instance, by learning a language outside your boot camp and then putting up an example application built in that. And you can like add in to read me, oh, this is just a pet project I made after learning, uh, I don't know, uh, Python for three weeks. And then I'll show, wow, this person can learn this much in three weeks and build a whole natural language, uh, uh, natural language processing model. Uh, that's actually possible thanks to libraries like Python NLTK, which is a natural language processing library. So what I'm saying here is, if you're interested in something like Cat GTP, you can literally build your own version of it within a week. I mentioned this machine learning course I took. It was one day machine learning, uh, a one day course. And I was able to build my own natural language processing model before the whole buzz around it in one day. And uh, there are a lot of programs that allow you to do that. And what this demonstrates is not only do you know this language, it shows you can learn very, very quickly. Again, that's probably one of your most valuable skills and assets as a boot camp grad. Boot camps are very condensed, unlike traditional education. So I would encourage literally all of you in an interview to mention that you're a quick learner because you went to a boot camp. Uh, so that's soft skill number one. Soft skill number two is being able to communicate with people across teams or across roles. When you're a software engineer, you're going to have to gather a lot of requ requirements. Uh, let's say you're building an e-commerce app and you need to know uh, how to render a sale price or you know something like that. You have two columns in your database, sale price and MSRP price. 
Well, starting out, you might not even know what the MSRP is. This will require you reaching out to people in inventory, sales, et cetera, to learn what it means in order to build that application. So uh, this is another way in which you can leverage your background. Whatever you did prior to your boot camp, you probably had to communicate with a lot of people. And this is a skill that someone who, you know, has been trained and scolded by their parents to be a programmer since birth might not be able to do, right? So look at your past experience. That might actually be an asset, partic particularly when it comes to communication. Um, if you were a chef, you are definitely excellent at communication. You're also excellent at things like time management. Look at your past skills and all of the soft skills there. Almost all of them will be applicable to you as a software engineer. Um, but I, to emphasize the most critical ones for engineering, I would say being a quick learner, communicating the gather requirements and time management, uh, noting that you can execute very quickly. Do we have any other questions out there? Because I can keep going. <laughs> Okay, so here's another question. So uh, in terms of, I mean, well, what a lot of us have heard with, with our guest speakers, uh, depending on what uh, tech company you're with, some of them have some type of mentorship program and some of them maybe not, maybe it's less structured. Um, what, in your experience, I don't know if this is more of a Dan question or a Sid question, uh, what is that uh, experience like at Google? Like what, walk us through those first couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months, how does that work? Google probably has the best mentorship out of every any company I've worked for and any major company I've worked for. At Tesla, there was virtually no mentorship. They just expected me to be an um, expert and uh, Tesla is so competitive and aggressive. They actually have internal hackers who will hack your code without even communicating with you. And they call it a red team. So I would say that's one end of the spectrum where you're just sort of left on your own, expected to work long days, et cetera. Google is very supportive. We, you know, Google likes to pride itself on being kind, not only to its employees, but also its users. Uh, you know, that's why I'm at Google. Google, I think, respects privacy more than Meta does, for instance. Uh, Meta also had good mentorship, but Google, we really want you to succeed here. Uh, so what does it look like? Uh, we have a formal nuclear mentor, which you interact with usually for at least a quarter, but it can be as long as you want. Some people still talk to their nuclear mentors. This is a mentor outside of your team, so you don't have to deal with any anxiety like, oh, is this person going to think I'm dumb if I ask this question? Google explicitly invests in that mentorship and separates it so that you're safe and you can learn from it. On your team, you'll generally have a mentor as well, a more project-specific mentor. Uh, people at Google are happy to do this because it looks good on their performance notes to show that they're helping other people. So I would say at Google, it's excellent. Uh, Meta is sort of halfway in between uh, the Tesla experience and Google in that they, they did have a mentor that I had for about a quarter, but from there, you were expected to be more independent. Um, and I, I just want to note that uh, there's no harm in getting mentored. It's only advantageous. Uh, the people who work at Google are brilliant. Um, again, I'm the only boot camp grad I know, but I'm actually taking advantage of that. Um, I have colleagues who have PhDs in machine learning, and I'm always eager to speak with them about machine learning. So uh, I, I think a lot of people are drawn to software engineering, maybe because they like technology more than they like people. But the great thing about becoming a software engineer is you're also going to meet other people who like software. So really make the most of any relationship you have on your team. Uh, it's it's the best, like I mentioned before, 90% of what you learn, you learn on the job. And a good percentage of that, you won't even learn necessarily on your project. It will just be from talking to people. Well, it, that does lead to the question that we have in the chat, which is, well, Sid, how did you get good at public speaking and technical communication? 
Uh, I don't consider myself good at public speaking. All <laughs> now, you all are are really nice. Oh, you're pulling out uh, the hats. <laughs> uh, but the, the interesting thing is, it is about technology. I, I only speak well when I'm talking about something I'm interested in, like uh, technology. Uh, demos are a great opportunity. When I was in boot camp, we had demo sessions, and it was funny because I was kind of quiet and like a little cynical and throughout the whole program, but I got feedback that when I was giving a demo, I completely changed. Uh, so I would say that's actually good practice is demoing software. And it's actually a good way to prepare for the interview because it'll get you used to talking about technical matters. You say you're using an application, you click submit on a form and, and just talk aloud about what the code is doing saying, now it's making a post request to an API I developed the API is hosted separately at a different address, and it will give you more confidence in talking about technical matters. So I would say demos are a great opportunity. You can even record a demo and include that on a personal website. Uh, again, it can sound like a lot of tedium, but I've heard recruiters say, hey, I reached out to you because of this application you built. I reached out to you because of your website. In my case, I didn't invest so much on the personal website, but I did have some applications that were open source. And they said, oh, I reached out to you because of this application. Well, it's something I can talk about all day because I'm interested in it. I wrote a lot of documentation for it. I would communicate with a lot of people on GitHub about it. I would say find something you're interested in, and it's doubly good practice if you find something technical so that you get practice for those technical discussions and interviews. That That is wonderful advice. And I know that you we want to be respectful of your time. So um, we do just have a few uh, other questions. We do have an additional one in the in the chat. So if anyone, this is your, <laughs> make sure if you have questions, this is the time to ask. Uh, but there is a, a question from Elijah. I don't know if you see that one. Yes, um, I do see it. So it's about connecting with people at larger companies like Google on LinkedIn. Uh, try to make it personal. Uh, don't just send a connection like boop and walk away. Try to include a little note. Uh, try to show you care about their profile. Like, hey, I noticed you went to this school. My friend went there or, you know, make it personal. Uh, again, all of these connections are a win-win. Uh, and uh, classes, do consider any class that has any social element to it. You can take self-study courses, but you can learn the same thing from a class that's social and use that as a networking opportunity. Uh, I took just a handful of classes like that, but they helped launch my career in a huge way. It was literally just three classes I'm thinking about, but they were huge networking opportunities. So I really encourage that. Okay, and not not to have that shameless plug, but for geeks, we also have a new program with data science and machine learning. Uh, Alyssa, our US campus manager, put the link in the chat. So if you're interested in pursuing that, please check that out. Um, uh, another question that someone actually uh, gave to me on the side is Sid, on your current day to day, are you primarily remote or are you in person or are you hybrid? And what works best for you in your uh, opinion? I'm I'm hybrid and I frankly hope this lasts. I think it's the perfect balance of work-life balance and working in office. Again, I consider myself to be a little bit antisocial, but there are a lot of benefits to working in office. Uh, sometimes people won't respond on chat just because you know they're grepping through logs or something's blowing up. They just will not look at chat. So you can just walk over to them and say something. So those three days in office are really useful. Um, plus, it's just fun. For instance, next week, my team is going to go glass blowing as a bombing activity. Uh, but I really do like the one, or, the one or two days I do spend remote just because sometimes I need to do things like call and make an appointment. And uh, so um, you have room to negotiate in these things, uh, maybe not right out the gate, but definitely um, you know, as you work at a place, if you want to negotiate for a remote day and all the other days are on site or anything like that, you should feel free to negotiate for it. And it looks like you do have one last, like, uh, one last question uh, from Mary. Do you see that as well? Yes. Uh, just to be very quick, interactive is good. Like I mentioned, an interactive chat app, 
Uh, you can uh, find guides to build applications in a single day for web conferencing. You can, uh, yeah, have that on your personal website very easily. But the last note, make it mobile responsive. A lot of recruiters check things on their phone just because they're like you and me, right? So whatever you build, make sure it works on mobile and desktop. That is definitely a great question because one of the feedbacks I keep hearing from recruiters is like, uh, do something original. Don't do the same 10 projects that everyone else is doing. But it's tough because when you're going through the boot camp, obviously those are the projects that people do. So um, I'm, I'm glad that you gave that feedback. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, one question, is there anything else? I think we are over time a little bit. Yes, yes. So thank you so much. And Dan, do you have anything you wanted to add? So, I mean, nothing uh, in, in particular. I think, uh, you know, Sid provided a lot of great info. Thank you all so much for all the great questions. Uh, one quick more plug to fill out the form to mark your attendance today. Um, the link is in the chat. Um, and feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Um, I forgot to include my LinkedIn link, but if you type in Dan Brown, Google, I should be the only one that pops up. So um, look forward to connecting with you all. That is awesome. Yeah, this was an amazing session. Thank you so much, Dan and Alyssa, for facilitating this, for Sid, for uh, giving us your time and, and letting us pick your brain about your journey from bootcamp to Google. Um, thank you so much. We hope that we will eventually see you again virtually at some point. And everyone who have joined in, please definitely, uh, like Dan said, please fill out that form with Google uh, to mark your attendance and also to keep in communication with both Sid and Dan and LinkedIn. I'm on there too. You can find me under, uh, under Loretta Thompson. And uh, until next time, please make sure that you check our Four Geeks Academy website for upcoming events. We have some things that are going online, uh, going in person, going hybrid. Uh, this is our summer of code, so there's a lot of opportunities uh, if you want to brush up on your code, like Sid said. And uh, that's pretty much it. So, um, yes, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Hi. Hey, Loretta. Yep. Advanced. I, I got you. I, I have. I'll right. send it to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.